today's reading is from Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 9. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another, or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Hi Christchurch London, uh, so glad you've been able to join us for Church at Home today. Uh, I'm actually preaching today from Philip and my new place. Uh, we've taken the opportunity to move closer into the centre of town. Uh, we've got a little basement flat. I'm actually in a unit that's directly under the pavement here, so I hope this works well. Uh, I'm excited to share with you the next instalment of our series on the Spirit Empowered Life. And I want to start by just reminding us why we're doing such a series right now. And you know, the first reason is simply this, that in the very best of times, the Bible expects you and I to be full of the Holy Spirit if we're going to live the Christian life in a productive, fruitful way. And whatever else you'd say about the last year, you could not describe it as the best of times. Uh, there has been so much suffering, so much difficulty in this sort of situation, we need the Holy Spirit. And not only do we need him in order to live for Christ, the sort of way that we should, but for many of us, we have struggled and suffered and life has been difficult this past year, often in ways that it's hard to articulate, but we know we're carrying pain inside. And when the presence of the Holy Spirit is around, when he lingers on us as we worship or as we pray or sometimes as we read the scriptures, it can have a very healing effect. I love the way the psalmist speaks of deep calling to deep. It's as if the work of God goes beyond what we can articulate with our words and our thoughts. And that is indeed what the Holy Spirit does. And I think for many of us, we will benefit hugely from that sort of healing touch at this point in time. I'm also trusting that as we do this series, the Holy Spirit will give us visions and dreams for the future. We've heard about that over the last couple of weeks. And as we are, we trust, nearing the end of this lockdown, and we will have more opportunity to be with others and minister to them, I hope, that you are using the Holy, your Holy Spirit-fired imagination and dreaming God's dreams as to what he might want to do with you and with us as we come out of this. Uh, we know there'll be a huge amount of need, huge opportunities to serve. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you dreams and visions of what we can do and what we should be doing as the seasons change. And finally, we don't just want to live for the future or wait until the pandemic's over. The Holy Spirit is also given to equip us for now. We'll talk more about that today. But I want you to uh, think about also those that you can be ministering to at this point in time. Four reasons, though, why we're doing this Spirit Empowered series right now. To heal us where we need it. To enable us to live the sort of lives we should live in this worst of times, that we may be equipped for the present and that we may have visions and dreams for the future. Today we're going to the Old Testament, a famous passage in Isaiah where he speaks of an unlikely hero. The suffering servant is spoken of in four different prophetic poems, 
and particularly in this one, actually in some of the others as well, it speaks of the way that this unlikely hero has the Holy Spirit upon him. And I want to suggest that as we look at the suffering servant today, we can learn lessons from his life and what Isaiah had to say about him for our own ministry at this point in time, our own service to this city. This suffering servant, when Isaiah spoke of him, was first understood to be the people of Israel. Uh, and they would have identified and sought to draw lessons from it. The gospel writers then take these passages and often draw parallels between them and Jesus. And the more we read of them, the more we see they are a prophetic description of our saviour, the king and the servant. But we, of course, are now God's body on earth. And these songs these poems were also applied to the church so just as they were for the people of God back in Old Testament times so they were anticipated and ready to be for Jesus so they also speak of the church's identity and therefore of your and my identity today and as I said the this passage which we've had read to us actually opens with these words about the Holy Spirit I will put my spirit upon him. And I want to draw out from this passage this today uh, three things which the Holy Spirit does, which I hope will encourage you to be thirsty for the Holy Spirit, to ask for more of the Holy Spirit and to draw on him all the more deeply as a result. First thing that the Holy Spirit does is he gives us an intimate relationship with the Father. Uh, it's not immediately obvious in this uh, passage as Isaiah chooses a metaphor to describe our relationship with the Father or ma uh, as master and servant. And that is essentially a contractual relationship. Master doesn't need to know anything about the servant, doesn't need to know anything about their personal life. In fact, if a master has many servants, he won't even know his name. And yet, as it works as long as the servant does what the master says and the master rewards the servant appropriately. So it's, it's transactional and it's contractual. I guess there's only one element of it that really applies to our relationship with God and that is that he is our master. Uh, we, do, we are here to serve him and to do his bidding. But Isaiah then takes this metaphor and he fills it with the most surprising content. It's a content of intimacy and of tenderness. He says that the master has chosen the servant. I love going to weddings. I know many of us do. And one of the reasons for that is to enter into the joy of this pair, this couple who are promising to be together for the rest of their lives. And I love watching this sense of excitement. Oh, wow, I get to be with this person. And then often through, during the vows, you see this idea dawn them. Oh, wow, they have chosen me. The guy might look at the girl and think she's chosen me. He doesn't think, what about all the other guys who she hasn't chosen? Now, that, that, that's not in the picture. He's just delighted and thrilled. She's just delighted and thrilled that he has chosen her. And that is what Isaiah is trying to convey here, this sense of excitement, this sense of personal choice. Now, I realise there's lots of theological questions around God's choice of us, and they're important and they matter, but they're not for this second in time. At this moment, Isaiah is saying there's something special here in terms of a relationship. I've been chosen. Not only that, but it says that the father, or the master rather, delights in the servant. Have you ever watched the parent of a young child pick the young child up and look in the child's face and watch the delight on the parent? Of course, the, the child hasn't done anything to delight them. The child's not passed exams. It's not got an amazing job. Uh, or a gold medal, or anything of that sort. In fact, at that point in time, the child can probably eat, poop, and sleep. And that's about it. And yet the parent is delighted 
And in the same way, Isaiah says, not because the servant's done anything, but just because of the master's love, he delights in us. The sense of choice, the sense of delight. Then it says that he will uphold the servant, literally grip him fast, grip him in his hand. Now, on my desk here, I've got a picture of the day that Philippa and I were engaged. And in the picture, I have my arm around Philippa's waist and then she has her hand on my hand. And when I look at the picture, I remember how Philippa's grip felt on that day. And it was a strong, firm grip. It was as if she was saying, I've got you and I never want to let you go. Well, in the same way, but all the more so, with divine power and divine command, he says, I have gripped you. I have got you and I will never let you go. And it's in this context of delight and tenderness and holding of the servant that he says, I will put my spirit upon you. Now, the spirit is what brings all of this to life. It's what makes it vivid. It's what takes head knowledge and makes it heart knowledge. When Paul writes to the Romans to describe this, he says the spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Mm -hmm. He's not talking here about reading a textbook and working through the logic. He's talking about the spirit coming on us and us shouting out, Abba, Father, the literally the intimate word that a child would use to describe their father in a Hebrew context. And that is what the Spirit does. My question to you today, the sort of relationship that I'm describing here, one of obedience, yes, but much more one of intimacy and love and delight and intuitive pleasure. Is that the sort of relationship that you recognise as your relationship with the Father? Or is it much more head knowledge. I know about him, but I don't know him in quite the same way. If that's the case, I want to encourage you to search out, to be hungry, thirsty for the Holy Spirit. It's not greedy to be thirsty for the Holy Spirit. We're actually commanded in the New Testament to thirst. We're commended for a longing for the Holy Spirit. We will get to pray before today is done. And we'll ask for more of the Holy Spirit. But I want to just sort of log this now. If we're knowing that our relationship with God is a bit cold at the moment, then let's seek more of him. And sometimes he comes in a moment. And sometimes it's a slower, incremental, but just as transformative experience. But this is where the relationship between the servant and the master starts, it starts with intimacy and it starts with love. And that's because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It then goes on from there for the Spirit is given to equip us for mission. The wonder of our relationship with the Father is not to be kept to ourselves. Uh, Isaiah anticipates that it will be shared with others. In fact, he anticipates it will be shared on two levels. Firstly, on a global or an international level. This love of God is to go right around the world. It's not to stop until it's gone to every people group. But it's also, says Isaiah, very personal. On the international front, it starts in verse 1, where he talks about that the servant will take justice to the nations. Uh, In verse 4, the nations are mentioned again, and then the islands will hope in his law. The islands are the extremities, the far off places. No people, whether it's any culture or any group, are too far off in any way for God's love. All will hope for him. And so this servant doesn't just have an intimate relationship, but is meant to take the love of God around the world, but is also to take the love of God to individuals. And those individuals are described as those that are captive in dark dungeons. And those words are talking about lack of liberty and blindness, lack of sight, are often used in the Bible to talk about the effects that sin have on us. They make us spiritually blind and they make us spiritually captive. But then we find those metaphors start there 
but also apply to our mental health and our physical health and our emotional health. I'm trying to say we all know lots of captives right now, lots of people that are far away from God, but lots of people too who are struggling in some of those other ways too as we continue to go down or go through this lockdown period. And the servant is to go to these people. I wonder who the servant, who you might be uh, being led to go to at this point in time. You know the thing which I think stops us more than anything? It's a sense of inadequacy. Yeah, we can believe that the servant goes, but for us to go, I remember being part of a prayer team for a conference on physical healing once and being asked to pray for a blind man. I went to him and I looked into his blind eyes. And as I did so and thought I meant to pray that he is healed, every bit of confidence evaporated from me. I just, I didn't want to be there. I felt I had nothing to give him. A prayer dribbled out of the corner of my mouth. I slunk away as quickly as I could. I looked back embarrassed, really, at the way in which I failed to serve him. But that is how I think many of us feel. Maybe not, we, we don't often get to pray for a recovery of sight, but with whatever our friends challenges are or whatever the challenges of the nations are there's a sense of I've not got what it takes now you should know that God understands that Jesus's advice or command to the disciples was don't you go on mission don't you leave Jerusalem until he said you are clothed with power from on high in other words until you've got the Holy Spirit many of us know what happened next they prayed for 40 days. In other words, the Holy Spirit's not always given instantly. They prayed for 40 days, then the Holy Spirit falls. And these illiterate rural fishermen stand up in the middle of the city centre. They speak to a sophisticated crowd of city dwellers and 3,000 of them come to faith. The difference that the power of the Holy Spirit makes. And these disciples became courageous where they'd hidden altogether, not sure what to do. They took beatings, they took threats of imprisonment, they took threats of death, they took death itself as they took the love of God and they kept going and going and going. And I want to encourage you, if you feel inadequate when it comes to mission, and I know how that feels, I want to encourage you, ask God for the presence of the Holy Spirit one particular individual that's kept coming to mind as I have prepared this talk and it's a woman who taught me a lot about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit back just after I'd graduated. Jackie Pullinger is her name out in Hong Kong. She tells the story of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and hours of prayer, soaking prayer over four or five days and the way it transformed her service in the urban slums uh, of, uh, of Hong Kong, uh, where she was at the time. You may be interested, if you've not already seen it, I got to interview her over the summer. Uh, it's on our YouTube channel, over 5,000 people have watched that interview so far. She is a remarkable individual, but she learned that it's only with the power of the Spirit that you can go to the lost, the least, and the last and you can take hope, and you can do something transformative, or at least God can be transformative with that as a result. So the Holy Spirit breathes on our relationship. He powers and strengthens us for mission. And the third thing that we see the Holy Spirit doing in these verses is that he enables the servant to live differently. I'm very struck by the descriptions of the servant in this passage. He does not raise his voice. He does not shout out. In other words, he doesn't take the current models of what's best in terms of leadership and life and imitate those. Rather, he lives the way the Spirit leads him. The current model, when Isaiah is speaking, is Cyrus. Cyrus the Great, the first a former of the Persian Empire, 
a moulding together of the first super state, many states, Osiris with his military genius trampled over nations, mercilessly butchering many, many people. Cyrus's life was the life of the might is right. And it's not what we see with the servant. The servant, rather than shouting out, seems to live with this inner confidence, this serenity, this sense, I know justice and goodness will prevail and I will keep going as a result. Where do you get that? Where do you get quiet, powerful confidence rather than uh, sort of you know, gobby, shouting, uh, bravado. You get it when your spirit has been affected with the promises of God by the Holy Spirit. Isaiah goes on, describes this servant as one who will not break a bruised reed and will not snuff out a smouldering wick. Cyrus would, Cyrus would trample the weak. Jesus does the opposite. There's many in this pandemic time who will trample smouldering wicks and broken and broken reeds. We are not to do that. We're rather motivated and empowered by the Spirit to bring healing to them. The healing love of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says too, the servant will not falter or be discouraged. He'll keep going. Right? If you've not faltered or been discouraged sometime in the last 12 months, then I want to suggest you're hardly human. Even Jesus got tired, even Jesus got discouraged, but the Spirit helps us to keep going. And it's so important at this point in time, as I said on a Zoom call to some of you recently, perseverance or endurance is often talked about in the Bible as a great quality. I want to encourage you at this point in time, keep going. Lockdown will be over soon. We can be together again soon. Uh, may God strengthen you with his spirit. So you see this picture of this uh, servant uh, deep in relationship with the father, uh, empowered with confidence. And maybe you'd call it irrational or unusual confidence. It's the confidence that God gives to take this love of God to the people in one's own world and to the world as a whole, but doing it in a very different way, quietly, confidently, loving and caring for those in need, refusing to give up. These are the qualities, these are some of the qualities that the Holy Spirit gives. Now, my question, as we just seek to knit all this together, draw this together this, this day, is do you need more of the Holy Spirit. Jesus encourages us to ask for the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, he says, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? And in a moment, I want to pray and I want to ask, for the presence of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. I want to pray that for many of us, there may be a newfound intimacy and delight, a sense of being chosen, a sense of being held firm. I want to pray that for others of us, we know his empowering and that birth of confidence that we might be able to go and take his love for his love is the answer and that we would do that in a very different spirit from the best leadership gurus or uh, the those that are profiled at this current moment. We can always learn something from them, but that's not to be our measuring stick. Our measuring stick is the ministry of Jesus and the way that the Holy Spirit leads us. And that is the way in which we are to be shaped and we're to be guided. So I want to pray. I want to ask whether you join me. I want to pray that many of us would have an experience of the Spirit. I want to pray to you that for others of us, a longing may start to be birthed in our spirit that might become all-consuming for more of him. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you be poured out in all the rooms, the sitting rooms, living rooms, bedrooms and other places from which this is being watched. And we open our hearts and our hands to you that we may 
know our hearts being warmed by your love. May we find delight in our relationship with you. Would you equip us for service? Would you form our spirits with confidence to serve in a Christ-like way? Come now, come, 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 Holy Spirit of God. I want to encourage us just to rest, just to wait. Allow him to work in your life right now. Be poured out, Holy Spirit. Pray for those with breathing ailments and difficulties that you would bring healing to them right now in the name of Jesus. For those with headaches and back pain, with stress-induced uh, ailments, would you heal them now in the name of Jesus? May you fill rooms with your presence and your glory. Would you equip us, your church, that we might be able to serve you with wonderful effect at this point in time. We love you and we look to you, Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, Amen.